Hello, everybody. We're going to be starting in a few minutes. The chair will be Margaret Prescott, uh, who is uh, moving because of some background noise. So she will be on in just a few minutes. Um, we wanted to say that for those who are Spanish speakers, there is translation. And we are chatting, putting the numbers that you can call into the chat box or you can find them on the Global Women's Strike Philadelphia Facebook page. Um, I'm wondering if there is someone who speaks Spanish who could translate that. Um, let me see if Kenya uh, is available. Kenya, I'm gonna take you off of mute for one minute. Hello, Kenya, can you hear me? Try this again. Oh, there we go. Do you want me to translate Hello, the Kenya. audience in this line? My, um, Hi, Hi Kenya. Can you translate into the Zoom what I just said, that there is translation and that people sí. can find the phone number in the chat? Hay disponible para esta llamada. Si ustedes gustan este, escuchar toda esta presentación y la junta en español, están este, proveyendo el teléfono en, en el chat del Zoom para que ustedes puedan ver el número de teléfono y el código, o también pueden encontrarlo en la página de Facebook de, este, de, esta, de esta junta. Thank you. That's great. You're uh, and if anybody has problems, they can um, put their questions into the chat box. Um, and you can get to the chat box by in the black bar at the bottom if you're on your computer. A panel will appear to the right and at the bottom look for where it says type message here and make sure it says to everyone and then type in your question and hit enter. If you're on the phone but using the Zoom app on your phone, you can click on participants at the bottom. Then on the participants page, click on the chats button at the bottom. Look for where it says tap here to chat or tap a message to reply. Make sure it says send to everyone. Type in your question and touch the send button. We also wanted to ask uh, before we get started, which will be in just one minute, uh, if people could type into the chat box what country you're from so we can see where people are calling in from. And that would be for everybody. Okay, thank you. And I will now get Margaret Prescott. So hold on, please. Yes, hi, good, hello. My name is Margaret Prescott. I'm with Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike and Global Women's Strike, which are organizing the Care Income Now webinar. The strike is an international grassroots network campaigning for recognition and payment for all caring work in the home and outside. Our slogan is invest in caring, not killing. We welcome everyone to this webinar, which follows on from the very successful March 20th Valuing Caregiving webinar put on by Women in Dialogue, in which 200 people from 14 countries participated. Out of that webinar came an open letter to governments for Care Income Now, put out by the Global Women's Strike and Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike and the Green New Deal for Europe. We did a limited circulation for pre-signers before releasing it to the public, and we're really delighted to report that 222 people thus far have signed it from 24 countries. 167 people signed up to be on this call today, and uh, we think this shows the dire need around the world for a care income. The letter has been translated into Burmese, Thai, Spanish, Italian, French, Chinese, Mandarin, and German. And we have the offer of translation into Dutch. So we're gonna keep the translations going. The link to these translations will be going up on the Global Women's Strike website soon. 
Now, there is a two-part agenda today. In the first part, five speakers will explore the implications of a campaign for a care income north and south to stop climate change, promote caring work for people and planet, and refuse work that's destructive to the environment as well as to the worker. This will be followed by questions and discussion, what payments and support the state governments have been forced to give in response to the COVID-19 crisis in different countries, and how the demand for a care income has entered campaigning to change the world and to save the world. First, I'd like to introduce Selma James. Delighted to introduce Selma, who is the founder of the International Wages for Housework campaign way back in 1972. She is the coordinator of the Global Women's Strike. She is the author of many feminist classics, including the forthcoming publication, Our Time Is Now, Sex, Race, Class, and Caring for People and Planet. Selma James. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. I'm very glad to be on. Um, we found the, uh, the Green New Deal for Europe when we saw that they had come out for a care income. As Margaret has explained, we have been fighting for the recognition and payment of caring for many years. But now it was for a care income, that is for the care of people and for the care of the planet, which meant that what the Green New Deal for Europe was proposing was that the two great movements for the liberation of the human race and the care of people and the treatment of the planet which enable, would enable it to regenerate and survive um, were coming together, these two movements, so that work for caring for people and work for caring for the environment would both be work that was respected and paid for. Now, I want to make it clear that payment was not because the work was worth so much. It was because the work was invaluable and therefore the people who did this work had to be remunerated in ways uh, that would enable them to live a decent life. That would first of all be the liberation of women. We would be liberated from our poverty, from our overwork, from our subservience. And this would enable us to be full participants in the transformation of the world. It would also mean the liberation of the waged worker, not merely the unwaged woman, the carer, the reproducer of the human race, but all of us who go out to work, who have very little ourselves, but who are involved as work, as things we must do in polluting the planet. We don't want to do that work. We don't want to do it because we hate the work and because the work that it, and the, what it performs is not what we need, not what we want. We want exactly the opposite. So this was our chance really to bring the movements together and prioritize the work that women do, the caring work that women do, which would enable us to have a new perspective for the economy and for everything in the world, which would be that people are what mattered, that the planet is what mattered, not profit or the market. I want to make just one other point. It says the Green New Deal for Europe but it is first of all international in its outlook and we are international in the way we are proceeding for the care income everywhere in the world. We have some things that we want to say about it. First of all, we look at the struggles that uh, women and men in the South have made and we begin to see the outline of what they want to produce and we have to, in the way of a newer society, and a society that is liberated and not exploitative, 
And from there, we can begin to understand what we are part of, because that is our movement too. But in addition, it is a movement against the new exploitation which the West has been imposing and which it calls green technology. Green technology can be read that you paint exploitation green. We have none of it. We are against it. We are part of the struggle against it. We refuse it. We also must say, we in Europe must say that the resources that are in Europe are at the disposal of every movement beginning perhaps in the, in the South, which has been robbed most generously by the North. Um, I, I, I just want to say that the speakers today are beginning to explore another way of looking at the ecology movement and it does the job, I think, of beginning to demystify waged work. We women have been told that to go in the West especially, but everywhere, have been told that going out to work is a liberation. We never believed it. And people who have done that work, like myself, are outraged that exploitation of any sort, but exploitation of women especially anywhere, is a liberation. Um, but I want to make just one final point, and that is what we are proposing is the end of overwork and poverty, and that's where we want to go. Thank you. Selma, I'm just cutting in uh, before back to Margaret that there's some problem with the translation that uh, Letty from Peru is not able to hear it. Um, and I want to just see if check in with the translator. Um, OK. Can, is there uh, issues with the translation? They can't hear me? Yeah. Um, do you know, apparently Letty from Peru is saying she's not hearing you. Um, are you getting other people on hearing you? No. Um, okay. Um, I'm on the call, so I'm not sure if she got disconnected. Um, like I mentioned before, and I think this has been an issue with, um, is this brief conference call? Yes, it is. Okay, they've been having issues because okay. they okay. are getting overloaded. All right, we'll just have to... Um, is there a way to tape your um, to tape your uh, translation so people can hear it later? Uh, Eric? If you want me to, are you recording this? You want me to translate it for uh, for we're her? We're recording team? it in English, but we're not getting the Spanish. And people, there's been a number of requests. If you send me the video afterwards, I can translate it all and okay. um, with audio, and then send it to you. Okay, um, let me check in with Nina. Nina Lopez, can I check in with you? How did, hold on, Nina. Nina, how does that sound? What, sorry. Well, Letty's not able to hear the translation and Kenya's offered to translate later because uh, apparently the conference call has been having technical difficulties. Okay. Okay, well, I'll tell Lady that then. Then we'll have to translate it and it'll be available in Spanish later. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying, yeah. Okay. Apologies to the people in Spanish. And we'll also ask the speakers to speak slowly so those with English are, who not the English is not the first language, can follow along. All right, so I'm going to go on mute and then get Margaret back. Thanks. Okay, she said something. Margaret, over to you. Okay, I've just been unmuted. Sorry about that. My mic was on mute. Uh, thank you, uh, Phoebe, and we'll get through this even with the technical difficulties for our uh, participants in the United States. When we talk about the South, we're talking about the Global South, the Global South and Global North, as opposed to South in the United States. I would <laughs> like to welcome our next guest, 
Our next speaker is Stefania Barca from Italy. She's a contributor to the Green New Deal for Europe. Stefania is an environmental historian with the Center for Social Studies at the University of Cambria. She is the author of An Alternative Worth Fighting For, Degrowth and the Liberation of the World. She will be speaking for herself. Sorry, somebody is speaking right now. Please put your mic on Nina. So, Nina, you're, yes, thank you. Um, Stefania Barca will be speaking for herself as well as for her close colleague, uh, Guacamo uh, de Lisa from Green New Deal for Europe. He's a political ecologist at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, Portugal. His forthcoming book is The Case for Growth. He's also participating, by the way, in the webinar today. Uh, Stefania, welcome. Thank you. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you to, uh, you need to Nina. To Stefania. I thought I did. Uh, I am unmuted. You can't hear me? Yes, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. Okay, good. Good. So thanks, uh, uh, thanks a lot to Nina Lopez and uh, Selma James uh, for uh, inviting us to um, contribute to this webinar. We also participated in the previous one. It was a very uh, wonderful and very enriching experience. Uh, I will be talking uh, on behalf of myself and Giacomo because we are both involved in this uh, Green New Deal for Europe platform that uh, Selma was mentioning before, together with Selma and Nina. Together, the four of us, we have been interacting um, during the elaboration of the document and talking about this idea of a care income. So what I will do today, I will give you an... Um, a brief uh, introduction to this European Green New Deal, to, just to give you an idea of what is it that I'm, we're talking about. And then I will uh, explain uh, what we mean by care income, what is the idea that we are trying to put forward. So um, in the early January of this year, uh, the European Commission has approved a Green Deal. And this is an investment uh, plan to uh, reduce carbon emissions in, in Europe. This is a neoliberal plan, a neoliberal response to the climate protests of the past few years. The Commission's plan is based on principles of green growth and, and the, the green, the, the techno fix that Selma was also mentioning before that we are rejecting. Uh, the plan gives money to the private sector to invest in greening production. And this, this plan is informed by the perverse logic of trickle down economics. Uh, the, the perverse logic of trickle down, it means that only if the market economy grows, does funding become available to compensate for the damage caused by growth itself, including climate change and the increasing inequality. This is the perverse logic. But this is not the only plan available. In the same months in which the Commission uh, was working on its plan, there was a network of researchers, intellectuals, and activists from all over Europe that uh, was formed to work on an alternative plan uh, called the, the Green New Deal for Europe. And, um, and then to, to, to include this plan in a large campaign for, of mobilization for the democratization of the European economy and of anti-crisis policies. So the basic idea is that uh, the economic democracy, that people have a right, European people have a right to, to have a say on the economic policies that are being formulated uh, against uh, the crisis, both the climate crisis and the social crisis and the crisis of care. Um, so the result of this process in which we participated was uh, the, is this um, a document called A Blueprint for Europe's Just transition. So the document adopts the language of just transition, which is uh, an international uh, um, uh, concept that has been uh, elaborated by the trade unions movement and by the indigenous uh, and environmental justice organizations in many, in many other countries. Uh, 
But the difference uh, between this and the, and the European Commission plan is radical. The GNDE, the Green New Deal for Europe, is based on redistributive public finance criteria, and, and it gives priority to the fight against inequalities and environmental injustice, and to economic democracy, and rejects the priority of GDP growth over uh, social policies. While the, that of the Commission is a top-down program addressed to the governments of EU countries to adopt market incentives for the benefit of companies, the GNDE is a, a, a political platform. It is addressed to social movements and it, it offers a strategic project, a strategic platform uh, aimed at urging broad mobilizations from below. Uh, basically, what the GNDE is a set of policy recommendations whose main objective is the systemic transformation of European institutions to make possible an equitable running of the economy without GDP growth, so that the climate and ecology can be rapidly repaired while also granting social justice at the same time. I want to sign out here two key mechanisms uh, of the Green New Deal. Uh, the first is the institution of a new public agency called the Green Public Works Agency that gives money to local communities rather than to um, uh, the private sectors uh, to generate millions of new public jobs in climate restoration projects. And second is an, uh, the institution of an environmental justice commission, an independent body of research, monitor, and advice to EU policymakers uh, to make sure that whatever um, policies uh, and policy measures are taken in, in within the European Green New Deal are not causing environmental injustice, are not causing environmental costs in, in any part, in any community, within and outside Europe. So in our opinion, the GNDE represents a historic opportunity for, for an economic revolution orientated by feminist and environmental justice principles. This is why we decided to accept the invitation of being part of the group. Uh, to ensure an equitable transition to a post-carbon economy, the plan uh, shifts the focus of collective well-being and welfare from industrial production to social and environmental reproduction. And so uh, to the maintenance, recycling, repair, and restoration of environmental and social infrastructures. In short, to the work of care, care for both people and for the environment. The care income is a key pillar of the GNDE. By care income, we mean direct and indirect compensation to be made available to all those who are engaged in life supporting activities, unpaid life supporting activities, uh, like the care of people and or of the urban and rural environments that make life possible, both in the home and in the community and in, in the, the ecosystem. How have, I, uh, have we come to this definition? We know from decades of ecofeminist uh, struggles and from the environmental justice movement, mostly led by racialized and working class women all over the world, we have learned from them about the nexus between human bodies and their environments and between the work of caring for human life and human health and the work of caring for water, air, soil, forest, and the non-human world in general that supports life everywhere. This nexus that is so difficult to recognize for the politicians and for the economists, it's clear and obvious for millions of people everywhere and is becoming centerpiece in the new climate justice movement, including the younger generations. So the care income proposal reflects this long-standing socio-ecological awareness and gives it full expression in terms of economic policy. The care income aims to compensate directly and indirectly all the work that countless people are already doing to support life against capital. For example, by organizing collective defense against extractivism and ecological degradation, or uh, through thousands of alternative practices at the community level that contribute 
to the rehabilitation and care of the commons. These practices of care for life have been fundamental to sustaining the human community through the COVID pandemic and are greatly supporting our ability to respond to it. It is high time to recognize that this is the kind of work that societies truly need and to reward it fairly so that our wealth does not depend anymore on jobs that deplete our bodies and destroy the natural world in a vicious circle of profit from degradation. In short, the care income is based on principles of ecofeminism and environmental justice. It recognizes the structural interdependence between human and non-human well-being, between peoples and environmental health, and supports the work of those who are taking care of it. Therefore, the care income does not advocate for social policies based on oil-related income coming from extractive activities which destroy the non-human world, compromise food sovereignty, and imply the sacrifice of some territories and the communities who inhabit them. Inspired by ecofeminist and indigenous visions and struggles, the care income recognizes that the only possible long-term wealth and prosperity is that founded on reconnecting the human with the web of life. Incorporating this proposal within its overall plan of financial and policy measures, the GNDE demonstrates that such revolutionary idea of wealth is not only necessary, but it is possible. It is a matter of political will, and this will must be solicited by struggles from the largest possible social coalitions. The care income, we believe, is a key strategic demand of the GNDE that responds to true social needs, especially at the time of enormous overburdening of care work like the one we are, doing, we are going through. It is important to mention though that the care income is fundamentally different from other proposals of basic income. In one respect, it does not represent an abstract universal right to income that is equal for anyone independently on their social position but rather a recognition and valuation of the immense amount of reproductive and care work that is normally expended in any society and the recognition of how this work is fundamentally needed to enhance life and is equally, if not more important, that so-called productive work. The aim of the care income is not like an universal basic income, that of guaranteeing a minimum level of access to goods and services on the part of everyone. It is, on the contrary, that of fairly compensating the contribution that reproductive workers give to society and the planet, work that is normalized and invisible. By compensating it both directly and indirectly, the, the care income makes this work a cornerstone of social wealth. In short, the care income is not universal and abstract, but embodied and materialist. It is worth repeating before ending that the, the care income is not a unique solution for all social problems, but only one among a number of policy measures that are articulated with each other to respond to the unprecedented crisis of our times. I just want to mention two very important demands that the GNDE articulates with the CI in the wake of the COVID pandemic. First, to adopt a European health and care standard that raises the bar for decent health and universal social protection provision and directs resources toward regions that fall below this standard to begin rebalancing health and care outcomes across Europe. Second, to fund a major buyback program for vacant housing stock. Social distancing is a privilege that is not available to everyone. With 38 million vacant homes around the continent, Europe can provide shelter for all who need it. So to conclude, we think the GNDE campaign is a historic opportunity and a resource of enormous importance for developing a feminist rethinking of the economy capable of meeting the climate ch challenge of our time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefania. Our next speaker is Sam Weinstein. Sam is with Payday Men's Network in London. He's formerly from the United States. He was a local union president with the Utility Workers Union of America in California when they won the biggest 
pay equity deal in private industry in the United States. Sam Weinstein, welcome. Thank you, Margaret. First, let me say that Payday is a network of men working with the Global Women's Strike internationally. We are delighted to endorse the Care Income Now campaign. While the vast majority of carers are women, there are men who do the work and deserve the money like our sisters. But overwhelmingly, men are either a reserve army of labor or locked into jobs that pollute, destroy, police, or maim both the worker and her, his community, including your own family. As one retired worker said, you are trading your body for money, selling your health to support your family. But if you are unemployed, you feel desperate to get one of those jobs where you spend your time literally wishing your life away while the work itself shortens it. One guy standing in front of me waiting in a line of several hundred for an assembly line job interview at Chrysler said, You'll do anything to get into the motherfucker, and when you're in, you can't wait to get out. We all agreed. In my experience, most people hate their jobs and spend their lives trying to avoid work. They want to do something else. A care income would be an encouragement and make that possible. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, there has been a huge social movement to make the environment of the worker safe. Yet to this day, 2.8 million people die every year from work-related disease and injury, and 374 million suffer non-fatal injuries on the job. I carry per permanent injuries and scars from nearly every manual job I ever did. On the blast furnace, the heat was so intense that despite protective clothing, it dried my knuckles up, and I literally had to ply my fingers open every morning. When I blew my nose, it came out black, and that continued for weeks after I quit the job. I won't bore you with the rest. One job with untold casualties each year is not counted in these work-related stats, but is particularly associated with being a real man. It's the military. Be all you can be is what they say in, in the US. They don't want us to know the total number of either military or civilian casualties of endless wars. We do know that the US military, the single, single greatest polluter on earth, has been fighting environmentally devastating wars in the Middle East to protect the largest polluting industry of all, oil and gas. That's what they do. That's what they're known for. Payday has a long history of supporting whistleblowers and people who refuse to do the killing work of the military, like Stephen Funk, Aaron Watada, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and the many Israeli conscripts who have gone to jail repeatedly rather than participate in the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Payday's slogan is, refusing to kill or be killed. And I suspect the earlier statistics don't include so-called, quote, factory farms, where much of our food is grown, picked often by migrant workers made up of whole families that take the brunt of literally back-breaking work and oceans of poisonous pesticides with which the crops are bombed and which all of us later consume. There is now a massive movement for regenerative farming about which Dean, who is on this call, will hopefully say more later. The earlier disease and injury statistics are dwarfed by the more than 4 million deaths annually from exposure to household air pollution due to the unpaid work of cooking on inefficient biomass stoves. Overwhelmingly poor women of color in the global south cook on those. Talk about needing a care income and a lot of workers' compensation. On top of pollution and destruction of the worker is the pollution and destruction of the workers' community. The most polluting factories are inevitably located in the poorest era areas. Bhopal and Chernobyl are two of the best known indus industrial disasters, each costing thousands of lives in their immediate future, in their surrounding communities, but they are only the tip of the I iceberg. A lot of white collar jobs also are also unnecessary, mind numbing or support the very deadly physical work I mentioned before. A few words about unnecessary. When I was a gas man, a lot of the work I did was on meters or collecting bills from people who couldn't afford to pay. 
It was useless work done to make a profit for the company by policing consumers based on their need for heating and cooking, things that should be a human right. There are lots of jobs like that. But there are notable examples of men making a fight for the right to be carers or to make things not destructive of society. The Lucas plan in the 70s was just such an attempt. Faced with downsizing, workers at Lucas Aerospace making military equipment proposed to management that they stop producing weapons, but instead retool to develop socially useful goods like solar heating equipment. And this was in the old days when that really, nobody was talking about solar heating equipment and artificial kidneys, something which was desperately needed at the time and new on the market. They wanted to design the work so that the workers would be motivated by the social value of the work they were actually doing. They knew that workers were the real experts. Unfortunately, these workers got little support from the union and some were fired by an outraged company. Most unions have unfortunately been unwilling to challenge man management's prerogative to manage what it produced in the workplace. The bureaucracy is terrified of both losing its membership and therefore the institution and their own personal jobs, but also of their me members being driven into the ranks of the unemployed. Blind to campaigning for something like the care income, they end up supporting the employer, however harmful to their members and the community at large. But not all. It's wonderful to see, for instance, that the Bakers Union in the UK have endorsed this campaign, and we expect that more will sign on. We sincerely hope so. Also in Germany, a few years ago, one and a half million members of IG, IG Metall, a heavy engineering union, went on strike for the right to work only 28 hours per week at full pay with the intent of taking more responsibility for their families. Imagine that. The men believed that the way to achieve a shorter work week was to demand the time and money for caring work. They didn't win everything, but as one union spokesperson said, we want employers to recognize that traditional gender roles in modern families are changing and we want workers to have the chance to do work that is important to society. Obviously, he didn't think that caring work in the, he did, he did think that caring work in the family was a lot more important to society than what was being done in the engineering sector. And a few days ago, workers building, building military aircraft engines at a General Electric plant in Massachusetts walked off the job, demanding that production be shifted to the urgent necessity of breathing ventilators, a demand to invest in caring, not killing. Margaret mentioned that I was in, involved in a huge pay equity settlement. We put the largest classification of women, those who worked in the call center, on the same pay scale as the largest classification of men who worked as I had in and around customers' homes, a raise of 13% for the women. The methodology used in that broke the jobs down into their constituent parts and showed that the women in the call center, the shock absorbers for the gas company, were multitasking in a similar way to managers a skill that most of the women used regularly doing unpaid work in the home. But once we raised call center pay, guess what happened? Men poured into the job. Pay the women properly and the men will come. Let me end by saying we don't know work, what work is really necessary. The military is not. We know that care work is. And a care work is an invitation to do that work and the beginning of finding out about all the rest. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Our next speaker is Solveig Francis. She grew up in Zambia on the continent of Africa. Solveig is a founding member in 1975 of the Crossroads Women's Center in London, England. She is a breastfeeding advocate, an expert in valuations of unwaged work, and co-author of the book, The Milk of Human Kindness. Solveig, welcome. Yeah, thank you, uh, Margaret. Um, yes, it's great hearing these presentations, um, which you feel really all you know, support breastfeeding. And um, just really everything about breastfeeding makes sense. And many of us already have a good idea of its multitude of benefits as a superfood for babies. 
breast milk provides a powerful immunity boost, so breastfed babies are less prone to a whole range of potentially fatal infections and other illnesses into adulthood. Breastfeeding continues the work of the placenta. It is part of making a human being, all animals in fact, and we must do as much as we can not to leave that part out. It saves mothers' lives, for example, less hemorrhaging after birth, and while expensive formula ravages the envir environment at every stage of production, breastfeeding is the most sustainable food going. A favorite breastfeeding placard at our center is plastic free, beautifully packaged. But what doesn't make sense then is that breastfeeding mothers are not recognized as workers. Breastfeeding is not seen as an essential part of our caring work that is both biological and social and makes an enormous economic contribution, for example, savings to health services. Yet we are not supported in this work and often don't have financial or food security. We can even be punished for breastfeeding. The sad stat um, here in the UK is that 81% of mothers start breastfeeding, but over a, third, uh, over a third stop by six weeks. Many say they stop earlier than they wanted because of lack of support and financial pressures. I think rates will vary in the other countries represented on this webinar. Um, and I think it will be you know, a similar story, but breastfeeding is under attack worldwide. And very often, even where we have one paid maternity leave, which I know is by far not everywhere, it's often too low. For example, here in the UK, it's a third of the average wage, pushing us to return to work sooner. And the uni almost universal huge pressure that women must have a job out of the home, no matter what the work is or the age of the child, also devalues this caring work. For women on welfare, it is enforced by compulsory interviews and sanctions. And breastfeeding mothers in prison are separated from their babies, as they can be in asylum detention. Social workers and the family courts don't hesitate to brutally snatch a breastfeeding child into care or hand custody to the father. And the cost in lives is staggering. Worldwide, over 800,000 babies under one mostly in countries of the global south, die every year from lack of breastfeeding. A silent genocide goes on while the multinational formula industry racks up profits of over $70 billion. So what could it mean if breastfeeding mothers were paid a care income and uh, other resources? We can get a sense where breastfeeding mothers are valued. For example, in Norway, 99% of women start breastfeeding and 80% still are at six months. But it wasn't always like that. In the 70s, a mother-led campaign forced the government to act. Formula advertising was banned. Breast milk is valued in the gross national product. Maternity leave is 49 weeks at full pay, with more paid leave after that. Breastfeeding breaks are paid. And in the UK, new mothers in a working class community were paid in the form of vouchers to breastfeed. Significantly more mothers breastfed and for longer. Imagine the result if it was a guaranteed cash income to breastfeed for as long as the World Health Organization recommends. Parts of Africa remain bastions of breastfeeding that must be protected and spread for all of our sakes and the planet. Even low income countries provide paid breastfeeding breaks, e.g. Rwanda, Tanzania. And at community level, a strong breastfeeding culture is upheld. For example, grandmothers led the fight against their daughters being pressured to feed their infants formula during the HIV crisis knowing that formula was a death sentence and this led to a change in policy oh thank you. you have less than a minute left okay i'm the last bit now a few things that a care income whatever form it takes for this life supporting work could do validate and strengthen our struggles everywhere to defend breastfeeding 
undermine formula industry lies and profits and put resources our way. Help us, our loved ones and society, respect our biological and caring work. Give us food security, allow us time to prioritize breastfeeding over other worries and demands. Help provide our children with what they need. Babies need breast milk to be in close physical contact with their mother and for their caregivers to be supported in every possible way. Okay. Alrighty, thank you so much, uh, Solveig. Our last speaker is uh, Pranam Samwang from Protection International Thailand. She works for and with community women human rights defenders, the majority of whom are engaged in struggles for life and against mining and mega development projects. Pranam, welcome. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, those of you here last time already heard from Lift and hey, Empower. Uh, we're hearing a bit of echo. I don't know if there's uh, something you can do about that. Um, not quite sure. Are you still hearing the echo? Well, you just, yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, for those of you last time, um, already heard from Lift and Empower that women in Thailand carry the responsibility of caring of our extended family that goes the same with the women in the other country in Asia and Latin America. But I, I like to start with a, a bit of the context. Um, rural indigenous and urban poor women have been organizing and they're fighting to be included in the public consultation and decision-making process, especially regarding issue of the land occupancy and management of the national resources. Women who are human rights defenders lived and work in the same repressive environment as the other women facing the same barriers and carrying the same responsibilities of care. For example, women human rights defenders from the community or rural best working for at least 12 hours without pay. However, those who become women human rights defenders significantly increase both of their burden of the care and their risk. Many people have been killed or disappeared simply trying to protect life, protecting land, and protecting the environment. The community women, community best women human rights defender, especially have been denied the right to the formal education and have little access to resources or finance support for their work. So by taking the leadership in the fight for human rights, women human rights defender break the traditional and can be punished for not complying with the rigid class and the gender norms or gender roles. For example, at-risk women human rights defenders in Mesoamerica consistently report that being shamed as a bad mother or being accused of having an affair is devastating because it creates conflicts within their own families. The one place, the family, that should provide a sense of belonging and security to women. Around the world, um, the per perception of women as the primary caregivers, as well as the reality that women are often responsible for the care of the family members, plays an important part in motivation of perpetrators to target their family members. I'd like to take you back to Thailand. In the last five years, the poverty rate in Thailand grew from 8% to 10%. And the absolute number of the people living in poverty is increased from 4 million to more than 6.7 million. 
Um, as you know, we under military government since 2014. Even we had election, but we getting back the military in the government. The military men in power keep using public resources to benefit their own interest. That is very clear. There is an increasing inland confiscation and lack of consultation on introduction of infrastructure projects. The environment is being poisoned and extractive industries are expanding. Um, families and communities are being displaced throughout Thailand and we know this is also happening around the world. It's impacting particularly on the women and the women who do the care work. Most of the uh, women human rights defender I work for and with are caring for, for land and caring for environment and the people. Uh, they provide food security to family and the community. Rural women's um, care roles, including farming, and also again, caring for the family and the community. Rural women in all of their village play a major role in all aspects of growing rice, including seed preparation, transplanting, weeding, compost application, and harvesting. This is the unwages work of the rural women in addition to the family care in the home. Um, one community, the Southern Faisan Federation of Thailand, which is our close comrade and the partner, and I think some of you may know them and have support them, we call SPFT. Um, SPFT was created in 2008 when a handful of the farming communities, women and men met and they agreed that their existing and surviving were rooted in their connection to the land and to each other. They farm land collectively and the women of SPFT lead the SPFT seed serving initiatives. SPFT has been engaged in the struggle for the right to use the land against the palm oil company for all a decade. Now they become a model of organizing in grassroots and also organizing model in terms of committee land title. But the risky and the exhausting work of resistance is also another part of the SPFT women's caring work. Women human rights vendor and their movement are not just the target of violence. We would like to take a good note on that. They are also innovator of effective self-defense strategies as a matter of survival and the resistance. Many grassroots organizations and networks integrated some form of the self-defense and solidarity into their way of organizing, and they do that every day. They are determined to be an autonomous, they're very determined to be self-sustaining group actively contributing to the new form of the social, new form of economy and political relations. For example, the Quich women of Guatemala defend their territory primarily through decision-making assembly or the communal care or economic solidarity, community guarding force having a checkpoint and emergency communication plans. Is enabling them to both preventing extractive companies from entering their land, but also creating an alternative way of living. And this is exactly what SPFT in Thailand also doing the similar thing. Um, from my personal point of view, but I think maybe some of you may agree, the international community has much to learn from the approaches of the grassroots movement and the community. In one community in northeast of Thailand, we call Nong Bua Long Pu, that's the name of the area. They have been fighting against stone mining for the last 20 years. They lost four members of that group. Um, recently, there are some of local academics together with the community, uh, start to do some little research, and they found out that 
um, yearly the people collecting the bamboo shoot from the forest, community forest around 70,000 kilograms per year from the forest. This is a forest they fight to protect. And it is better than a supermarket for women. Um, since every day women can go to this forest, they are harvesting the mushroom, the bamboo shoot, and many herbs, many, many herbs, which is economically value over $3 million a year. But again, the work of the women who carrying off these forests is not yet recognized or value economically. Um, the other issue is the collective, the women defending rights have also made important contribution to how we understand risk and protection. They help us to see how women play a, play a critical um, role in defending rights in their community and the families. Of course, this is not yet formally recognized and still very, very visible. Um, that form of the critical role is such as many mothers and sisters who are in pursuit of justice of the loved ones, not only to defend themselves, but to defend men, which is what women were also Okay, have we lost um, Pranang? Were you finished? Maybe she lost her connection there? I think we lost her connection. Okay, well, perhaps she'll be able to rejoin us and, and finish her thought. Uh, but what we'd like to do in now Indonesia, is... Indonesia, Honduras, there she is. Brazil, and many, many countries of the world. Um, the women human rights Pranam, you're cutting in and out a bit. If you could just repeat the, your last thought there, the last sentence. Okay, so we'll, we'll get um, Pranam back on as uh, soon as she resolves her technical Hello. issues. Yes, Pranam, we can hear you now. Please repeat, oh, you can hear me now. Your, last, repeat your last um, bit because we missed that. Thank you. Oh, I can't see. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the Women Human Rights Defender um, Collective of Thailand, um, which we are very, is a very exciting platform, we collectively organizing together. Um, we are at the beginning of the seeing how our situation related to those of the other and what is mean um, for us to our life as a collective organizing. Um, we are trying to understand collectively the value and demand payment for the work that is absolutely central to the life and to our autonomy. And we trying to understand that the women's struggle wages carrying labor is fundamental to women's economic autonomy, which is will led to the strengthening our political power and our autonomy as well. Um, again, our care work, especially the women who take care of land and environmental, has been too long of invisible. So there is a sense of not knowing that we are demand for it. We can demand for it, for example, um, because women in the South has been cheated and stealing of their money both politically, economically, and in community. So women didn't have it, women didn't have the power of it, and the women need it. Um, there are many policies in Thailand that show some recognition of the caring work, Pranam, such as I'm newborn sorry, baby you're... support subsidies, not, the state provide a benefit to mothers who qualify for the first six years of the child life. Um, but this is a very small amount of the money, eh? it's about 20 USD per month. To qualify one must be living below the poverty line, and we have a very low poverty line. You, if you have the income of less than 90 USD per month, uh, then your poverty line. The policy Pranam, does not come Pranam, right you, for the entire, Pranam, you might have entire not heard of it. the care world. 
You have That's you have to wrap up, up for now. We have to caregivers in this family. Um, Sorry, Pranam, um, you, you need to wrap up because your time is up. Okay. Pranam, we, we really uh, understand the technical difficulties that you are having uh, speaking to us uh, from so very far away. We appreciate your uh, participation and perhaps in the question and answer session, which is coming up now, you'll be able to share a bit more with us. But what we'd like to do now is take your questions for the speakers. We're asking that you put your questions in the chat box and also to say which speaker you would like to address your question to. Nikki Adams, thank you, Nikki, will be gathering uh, the questions. Now, to use the chat, if you are on computer, click on chat at the black bar at the bottom of your screen. A panel will appear on the right and at the bottom, look for where it says type message here. Make sure it says to everyone. Type your question and then hit enter. However, if you're on the phone using the phone app, click on participants at the bottom, then on the participants page, click on the chats button at the bottom Look for where it says tap here to chat or tap a message to reply. Make sure it says send to everyone. So please type in your question and touch the send button. Um, Nikki, I'm not quite sure if we had some questions already coming in as people were speaking. Um, Nikki Adams, or should we just take a, a few minutes to for you to gather those questions. Nikki? No questions yet. Okay, so again, we are, if you're on computer, um, please go to click on the chats button and make sure it says send to everyone. Um, you can also do that uh, by phone as well as by computer. But just make sure that you're sending your question to everyone and please say which speaker you would like to ask your question of. Uh, while we are waiting for those questions, we wonder, uh, Selma James, if there was anything from what you've heard, anything additional that you would like to share with us as we're gathering those questions. Selma? Well, there, there was one thing that I should have said and left out, which was, we want the resources to, for the Global South um, that they need and ask for, but we don't want to send it via governments because it always winds up as military equipment rather than as cash or services or whatever people want and need for rebuilding their societies and getting the imperialist structures out of their so to speak, e ecological system. So that's a problem that we have in Europe and North America and Japan and the other societies that are technologically developed. We need to get the resources that people in the Global South want and we need to get it to them without moving through the governments that are usually put there by the imperial powers to prevent the, the people from getting what they need. Margaret, there's two, um, there is a question, and there's also information sent. Uh, for, it, after Solvig spoke about breastfeeding, somebody uh, pasted a link to the green, a green feeding a website which looks like it has a lot of very useful information and it may be people that something that people are already in touch with but the question that we've had at the moment is from Melissa and it says are there any risks to demanding a care income and how do we mitigate these risks I don't know if you meant for that to be directed at a particular person Melissa to the one who spoke about the shockingly low maternity protection laws in the UK, or anyone can answer. 
All righty. So any of our panelists want to respond to those questions, any comments? Well, I've, I've already spoken. If no one else wants to speak, I, I would say there are no risks to a care income except the risks that there are to every movement, which is that the ambitious try to take them over and work for the other side. That's what we've been facing generally in the movements that we've built. And we don't want careerism in our movement, and we must recognize it as the enemy within. This is a tremendously important job we have found as a growing movement that we have always to confront. Thank you, Selma. Uh, Nikki, any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Stefania would like to respond to this one as well. Stefania. Yes, thank you, because I, I cannot mute, unmute my microphone, so I, I didn't know how to, uh, but uh, I, as I understand, I need to uh, uh, write here in the chat, right? Okay, so my answer, I see um, a risk in, uh, one risk I can see in demanding uh, care income is the, that there is a, a neoliberal version of basic income that um, uh, tends to see it as um, a, a substitution for social policies, so that you give money directly to the people, and then you take back you take back from the public sector what you have given them individually. So I think that uh, for me it is very important the fact that the care income uh, campaign is embedded in and is part of this Green New Deal for Europe uh, proposal, which is. Uh, a whole uh, package of transformative policies all articulated with each other. That's why I may also mentioned, uh, for example, the, the housing um, proposal for recuperating unoccupied homes all over Europe or, uh, or the, the public health proposal for redistributing resources uh, more equally on the European scale, just to make clear that care income is not a solution, one solution for all problems, like, like sometimes proponents of basic income sometimes tend to see that. We don't agree with that, and we, we think that, at least this is my personal, I'm talking about uh, from my perspective here, uh, but this is uh, uh, the response that I would give. Okay, thank you, Stefania. Um, Nikki, yeah, are there, to... there are a few other people, right, who wanted to respond to this? Well, Sophie said yes, but then she thinks that uh, the point was dealt with, I think, largely. And then um, a, message, a, a comment from a couple, one person about just generally the low value placed on care work, especially for people with disabilities and, if you're, if you're, and your housework that's not represented in the care income. And then a message from Daniel, which is for Stefania, Selma and Sam or anyone. And it says, um, does it explicitly, does the European Green New Deal explicitly include the diversion of resources from the UK, EU, arms industries and military budgets to a care income? And how will the Green New Deal, which is focused on Europe rather than globally avoid the continued expansion of resource extraction from the global south for green technologies in the north? I think that's a question that Selma started to touch on at the beginning. All right, uh, any of our panelists uh, tackle that? That is for Stefania, uh, Selma. Selma and Sam or any panelist. I can only say very briefly that uh, the, um, uh, the Green New Deal mentions briefly the need for diverting resources from uh, uh, the military industry towards uh, this plan, but it doesn't really tackle very uh, clearly and very exhaustively this aspect. So this is probably something that should be Im improved. Um, I think that um, what the care income must do is help to build a movement. And it is only with building that movement can we get done what we want done. 
Diverting resources to the global south is a crucial part of what we must do, what a movement must accomplish. The thing about the care income is that it is potentially movement building and it brings together all those forces of subversion and we'd better be subversive, this thing won't go away by itself, mm -hmm. um, in such a way that we can begin to act in a freer way. We can see our possibilities. We can see more hopeful signs of the activity that we do. And it can bring people together despite the the terrible power relations among us, which the Green New Deal for Europe doesn't touch on, but which we in the global women's strike absolutely concern ourselves with, um, not only the power relation between women and men, but the racial divisions, the division of native and immigrant, the, um, <coughs> the elder and the younger, those of us who have jobs and those of us who are unwaged and have a lot of jobs but no money, all the, and the the you know your passport is so divisive in the sense that so many people don't share it or sh have that passport but don't have the one that they need. All of these divisions must be confronted in a movement if the care income is attractive to a lot of people and can see its value beginning with women but also beginning with those of us who are also concerned with the climate the possibility of movement building is enhanced and that will want plenty there are many things that it will address itself to because we can see possibilities and we can see the power of the movement. We in Britain have suffered a defeat with the movement that we have built and which was uh, undermined in many ways. But I, I think the movement in a lot of places, including even in Britain, um, is finding its way and is beginning to tackle some of the divisions among us. We must deal with the what Sam mentioned about the unions. Some unions are on our side, but some win, some unions are not. They're defending Trident, for example, and HS2, both polluters and exploiters. And we just have to get it together with this kind of a perspective. I think we have a better chance. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. Um, if I could just add something quickly in terms of the global south, while the Green New Deal for Europe specifically talks about Europe, the demand for a care income is one that impacts us everywhere we are. I'm from the global south, from the Caribbean region, growing up you know, in a, in a village type of environment. And the work the Global Women's Strike did during the UN Women's Decade, we found that we got enormous amount of support from women on the continent of Africa, from the global south, when we were fighting for getting this work, right. unwage work in the home, on the land, and in the community measured and valued. So I think we have to be clear that this is a demand that is a global demand. In the United States, the National Welfare Rights Union has taken it up as an absolute must uh, for the most impoverished uh, women in the United States. If that would help the brother that asked the question in relation to the Global South. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, Nikki? A, yes, uh, I think this question might actually be taking us to the next session. It's from Laura, and it's uh, Laura Carlson, and it's about a, a bibliography of care income policies and initiatives in other countries. I think that's what being revealed by this uh, coronavirus crisis opens up opportunity opportunity for these proposals in specific terms. And she says that here in Mexico, we may have an opening. And then the second question is one in terms of if people are studying a care income, what are the feminist 
authors that can be cited that originally came up with the idea, the concept and redefining care. But that was a question that was originally on email and it might be one that needs to be answered directly uh, on email. But Laura's one is about how it's translating in, in, to, in practically in different countries a care income. Go ahead. Okay. So I, Margaret, shall I, shall I uh, do a little yes. recap now? Nina, yeah, because we, we've actually, as Nikki indicated, we've moved into part two. And we had asked Nina Lopez of the Global Women's Strike to give us some idea of what the state in different countries has been forced to give in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Nina is originally from Argentina, lives in London, and she'll be followed by Phoebe Jones in Philadelphia, also from Global Women's Strike. Phoebe chaired the first webinar there representing uh, women in dialogue. Just to move into the, the discussion that I think Laura Carlson's question in, indicates. Thank you, Nina. Yes, I just wanted to say that it's, it's really a good question. And I think that the, the, uh, the, um, the virus, the epidemic caused by the virus, which has been so horrendous and which is causing so many deaths in so many people, has really exposed what the governments are all about and has in some ways united the populations to demand that survival and well-being has to come first. Because what we have seen is that even healthcare workers are being deprived of what they need to survive this epidemic, just as they are the ones who are fighting for our lives, not only their own lives, but especially for our own, uh, uh, our own lives. And many of them has, have died. So people are totally outraged that there is clearly a policy of genocide especially of all the people, especially of people with disabilities, that is unfolding in many places, in particular in the UK. I think you know that in the UK they decided not to test and that the population should develop herd immunity, as a result of which it then turned out that maybe half a million people were going to die. And once that came out, they couldn't quite carry on with it because they were going to be exposed. So they've had to change their tactic. And uh, there's been a lot of pressure coming from all kinds of sectors, including parents who are now being forced to stay at home because the, the schools are closed. So the mothers are staying at home to look after the children, including from the health workers who want their protective equipment, etc. So in the UK, the government has been forced to promise that they're going to pay up 80% of workers' wages up to a total of 2,500 a month. And that includes self-employed people, which are normally excluded from such things. And also that they're going to increase universal credit and tax credits. As you know, there's a, many people probably do know, there's a welfare state in this country. Sort of since the Second World War, which has been dismantled bit by bit and very, very quick, especially in the past 10 years with the policies of austerity. And universal credit is a, a really outrageous benefit, which replaced uh, benefits that we had before by right, and which has meant the destitution of many, many millions of people because people are being cut off and sanctioned. And as a result of it, there's been um, a, a growth in food banks, where, which are basically charity where people go and get some food, which never existed in this country before since, the, the, since they started the welfare state. Anyway, they've had to increase it by 20 pounds a week, which is really tiny, but nevertheless, and one million people, nearly a million people, have applied for it in the past two weeks. So it just gives you a sense of what's going on. Um, they've also have, have to put a hold on evicting asylum seekers from state accommodation, which is a, a big victory for the anti-deportation movement. I want to say, this. I'm only touching on some countries, okay? This is by no way an extensive anything. Uh, in Ireland, they're doing much better than in the UK. I have to say, there's a, a bigger movement there 
and they're winning 350 euros uh, a, a week, I think it is, of emergency support payments for people who have lost their job as a result of the pandemic. And in, again, this includes the self-employed. And they're getting statutory sick pay of 350 euros a week from day one. And the government is to pay 70% of workers' salaries, this is the people who are not able to carry on with their jobs, up to a maximum of 410 euros a week. Now, there's something that they're calling a COVID uh, care income, we're calling. Okay, which means that the spouses of frontline workers, like for example, health workers, or you know, other workers who have to carry on maybe in supermarkets or you know, food production, could be provided with extra support in order to remain at home as part of a, cap a package of childcare support. I mean, if you, you know, that is definitely a care income. There's a ban on evictions and homeless families, families are being fast-tracked for accommodation, which is, you know, really good news. And also the nationalization of the health service. Ireland did not have a health, a you know, a free health service like we do here in the UK. So that is really big, uh, big, big news in Ireland. Some prisoners have been released as well and deportations have been suspended, and undocumented workers who contact the health service are not going to be reported to the authorities. So you can see that people are winning all kinds of sectors are, are winning various things. But very quickly, in Denmark, the government is going to pay up to 90% of salaries. You know, they're always ahead with the amount of money that they give out. Can I put and the government is also paying sick leave from day one for employees who are infected with COVID-19. In Portugal, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Stefania and uh, Jacobo know all about it, there's a temporary amnesty for immigrants and immigrants are going to be allowed to use the welfare state like Portuguese citizens. Again, this is a big thing. Now, I just want to touch quickly on Thailand and uh, because, you know, the th in the third world, those of us who are in the south, even when it's in the north, it's always so much more difficult to get any money from the state. However, apparently 20 million people have applied for financial aid in the, less, in the last 48 hours, which is amazing if you can imagine that, which is seven times the number the government expected. And some parties are now demanding cuts to the military budget. Now, Thailand, as was said by the previous speaker, had or had a, a bits of welfare. You know, they have some support for poor families, which they call milk money. They have an age pension, uh, and they have a disabled allowance, and they have some universal health care. Uh, but now other, other pressure is being put on the government to provide more things. So there's a three months lump sum which has been promised to Thai wage workers, including the self-employed and casual workers who have been impacted by COVID-19. And there is a reduction in some utility bills and no, and no disconnections. Okay, so that's important. And I, I also heard that in France, the government has said that they're going to provide housing in hotels for victims of domestic violence. And there's been a lot of pressure in many countries of the world on the issue of domestic violence, because of course, if you have to stay at home with your violent husband, you're not in a very good position. And the women and children are in many, many households uh, suffering dreadfully as a result. So that is just to give you a taster, and I know that in the US you've also won some important examples of a care income, which Phoebe was going to say something about. Yeah, thank you, Nina. Um, yes, exactly. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in 2008 when they had the big crash is that, um, you know, the banks got bailed out and nobody else. And people have ever since then been, you know, determined 
that we're going to get something out of this, you know. So there has been a big fight for money to actually get to people. And that would include, you know, more unemployment extended to people and benefits and making it easier than it's ever been before. And some of the other things that you mentioned, Nina, about fewer people being arrested and so forth. But in terms of actually money coming to households, um, the stimulus impact package does include $1,200 for each adult and $500 for each child. Now, we have to say the United States does not have child benefit in this country. And that $500 going to each child did not come out of nowhere because what's been going on for the last year or so is a focus on children's poverty and that um, and bills in Congress to actually tackle that poverty called the American Family Act. And the proposal has been for $300 per month per child for everybody. The, before the tax credits were only if you made enough, but this is for what they call fully refundable, which would be for everybody to get it, no matter if you make enough to file taxes or not. The, um, we, we've been still pressing for that, but we at least got a one-time payment of $500, which is a huge victory in the US. And we're using it to now going for it every month per child. But what we have need to be and what we've been trying to focus on and fight for is that that money come directly to the primary caregiver and not to the main breadwinner because that is just reinforcing men's power over women and the domestic violence you mentioned you know women would be dependent on getting that money for uh, for the kids through the man and that's not acceptable you know it's, that's a recipe for disaster and as everybody around the world knows you get the money to the woman, it goes to the family, and that is not necessarily true with the men. So it's absolutely critical that we 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 win that. Um, uh, there's many problems with the stimulus bill. I mean, it's not getting to a lot of people. It's not getting to undocumented people. It's not getting to those who don't have a social security number. They're fighting whether or not you over whether or not you had to have filed taxes because so many people don't earn enough to even file tax returns. So can they get the stimulus or not? So people are massively fight, you know, trying to, to file tax, um, get, you know, file taxes so they can get the, get the bill with also balancing though too, are they going to somehow come under scrutiny and therefore, well, why haven't they filed taxes, et cetera. And there are people, including the guy who does our taxes, who's trying to make his expertise available to people to help them get on. And I think a lot of people who are in those situations are helping people. So that's, that's for a start. And we're also trying to fight to make sure that you don't lose your other benefits if you get this money. Because the big problem is, like if you get housing, very strict limit. People can't take any more money because they will lose their housing. And so we're trying to say, get these benefits not included as income and therefore not jeopardizing other benefits people have been able to win. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. And adding to that also, unemployment benefits have been extended. I think people may have heard that the unemployment numbers, and that's a low ball, is now about 6.6 .6 million people as of yesterday. That's close to 10 million uh, people, and the number is far greater. But they are now saying that people who apply for unemployment will get $600 per week on top of what the state unemployment uh, benefit level is. Some conservatives oppose it, saying that for some low-wage workers, it means on unemployment, they'll be getting more money than they did with their regular uh, pay packet. Uh, there's also been rent strikes that have been going on, kicked off in Los Angeles yesterday, over a thousand people that we know of, also major cities, Chicago, New York, et cetera, and people are also occupying homes. So those are also ways, the movement, they're finding ways uh, to reclaim and, and get, claim a kind of a care income. All righty, Nikki, other questions coming in? Nikki needs her yeah. uh, unmute. Yeah. Oh, I'll unmute her. Also, Margaret, we, um, 
we can uh, start to get people um, raising their hands too, if you want to give those instructions. Let me find Nikki to unmute Okay, her. yeah, if, oh, if you I'm want to add a computer. Okay, so there's about four different questions. Um, okay. One is, is the first one is, how is care work defined? Are any tasks related to production included or only life-sustaining activities encompass? So that's one. And then how can the care income trap be avoided by not reinforcing gender stereotypes and assuming even more because of the salary that certain people, depending on their gender, are assimilated to certain tasks? And that one they're thinking part to be directed to Sam, but maybe to others. And then how would a care income affect the people who are the receivers of such care? For example, people living with visible or invisible chronic diseases. If they are not able to perform care work, would they be excluded from any income? And then uh, there was another question that I think may have now been answered by Nina and Phoebe about the possibilities that are being opened up with this coronavirus about care, uh, about care being focused on, you know, there's so much of a focus on caring work. Right. There's one other coming in, but I think those is, that's quite a lot. So it's fundamentally about how care work is defined and is it only related to life sustaining activities or production as well? How can the care trap, care income trap be avoided by not reinforcing gender stereotypes? And what about the people who are the receivers of such care? Thank you, thank you, Nikki. And, and while um, the panelists are going to respond to that, just wanted to say that if you are on computer, you can raise your hand by going to the participants panel and down at the bottom of the list of names, you should see a button named raise hand and click it. If you are on the Zoom app on your phone, you can raise your hand by going to participants and clicking on your name in the list. You should see an option that pops up to raise hand. So um, panelists, you'd like to respond to those questions? They'll need their uh, mics unmuted, Fee. Okay. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, I, uh, on the question of how care is, first of all, on, on stereotypes, the thing about the care income that I like, there are many things I like about it, but one of the things is that it equates the care of people with the care for the environment which means that you are not caught in any stereotype, which means that care for life, whether it's life that is human or life that is nature, are both respected and concerned about, and the people who care for it are entitled to an income so that they may maintain themselves and their activity. This is a contrary to um, anything that has to do with uh, sex role stereotyping. Uh, women may be carers for the environment, in fact, often are. You know, uh, B, who spoke from Thailand, spoke about the care that people give to the environment as an important part of their work at, in the community. And that's often true. There have been massive movements of women um, the Chipko movement was the one we knew best, where thousands of women all over India uh, hugged the trees to prevent them from being cut down. And um, that was one that really woke people up to the struggle for the environment. On the question of, um, there, there was, you'll have to remind me, Nikki, there was one on how do you define care? Well, the thing is that people know what care is, and that can be really socially defined in any community. But one thing that we know about, mothers are carers. And because of the way in which caring has been attacked or ignored, both ways of attacking it, um, is that mothers are not mentioned. We've moved into the age of the parents, so we don't know who's given birth. 
We don't know who's been breastfeeding. We don't know who's been changing diapers or nappies. As a matter of fact, we don't know if the work is going on at all. But we want to know if the work is going on. At least we want to acknowledge it because it's going on under our very noses and often we are the ones who are, most of the time, it's women who are doing it. And that discussion in the community of what care is. Now, I want to say that, I want to say particularly about people with disabilities. People with disabilities are carers. They are carers, first of all, for themselves. Because those of us who have disabilities usually suffer from a society that doesn't count on us and doesn't make a way for us. And therefore, we have a lot of work overcoming the obstacles that society presents. But in any case, maintaining yourself with a disability, I have a couple, is a lot of work and you are entitled to help with it and acknowledgement for that work. So there is absolutely no question of whether you, as a person with disabilities, are entitled to a care income, and those who help you at your behest are entitled to a care income as well. There were other things that were asked about. Can you tell me what whether they are, Nikki? Whether it included production. What? Whether it included production, the, the life, whether it's only if life sustaining mean, activities or whether it includes production. What I'm does sure. it mean, production? We are not. not sure. If it means working for an income as a carer, it certainly does include a living wage for the carer. If she want, he, she or he wants to continue with that work, these are choices that an income gives you, whether this is the work you want to do to the exclusion of other work, or whether once there is a care income, the whole distribution of care in the community is absolutely transformed. You have to have a movement in order to get it. And once you have a movement, you can organize things very differently. And in a more humane and suitable way for all the individuals who are involved, that is, all the individuals in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. Um, Nikki, can I, other, yeah, can I, 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 go yeah. ahead, Sam. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wanted to, to say something about the gender, gender stereotyping. Um, in my experience, money actually smashes the gender stereotypes in a couple of different ways. One, as, as I pointed out, um, when we raised the pay of women, all of a sudden, the men were much more interested in getting into the jobs that had been overwhelmingly dominated by women. They were not afraid of any gender stereotype. They went after the money. It was, you know, it was kind of simple like that. And, and something I should have said before, there are two ways, really, in which women having money um, helps men. One, it poses the possibility, as I said, um, that the men can do those jobs and get that money and do that caring work and get, and get that money. But the, there's another way in which it also does it. Because a lot of men are in the situation, or I should say a lot of women are in the situation where they're dependent on men, right? for a wage. They're taking care of a baby or a kid or whatever, uh, or, or several kids, and they're dependent on the man for the wage, which kind of puts the man up against the wall in terms of staying in that job and not fighting for what, 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 what needs to be fought for. I mean, Selma talked about the, um, the caring income being a movement builder, and that's absolutely how I see it, right? It is a movement builder, and it's a movement builder among men. If women get money, the men are much less tied to the job, and I have a much better chance of fighting back, fighting against all those industrial injuries, fighting for work that really needs to be done, and, and fighting for their families. They are much less dependent than they were on the employer. 
And I think we do have to keep that in mind. The stereotype, you know, the society has been pushing women to give up the stereotype of being women and go into men's job as the only way they can get equal pay. To me, that's outrageous and makes no sense and has been a complete failure. The reality is women need to get money for the work they actually are doing and have no choice but to do, frankly. What needs to happen is that the men need to join them in doing that work and hopefully getting some money for it. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Nina, Nina wanted to speak. Uh, Nina's mic needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Yes, sorry, I wanted to add, you know, the example that was given, child benefit in this country that exists as a payment to mothers, it goes straight into mother's hands, was something that an independent woman and peer feminist fought for for many decades at the beginning of the last century. And it was finally won at the, as the first measure of the welfare state, and the first payment was in 1946, and we have it until today. And child benefit was precisely so that women would not be completely dependent on men and would have money of their own, and that men would not be completely dependent. That was the argument that was made. For example, if they went on strike or they couldn't go on strike because otherwise the whole family would starve, they said, well, if your wife is getting child benefit, then you can go on strike without having to worry whether or not the kids are going to lose or not. So that you could see that giving the, the money to the mother in, in recognition of her contribution to society, which was massive and that was recognized, although the money that, that we won was not massive, but that the recognition was a really important first step and we have it to this day and we want to build on that in every country. And that's what we were so delighted when the US for the first time you know, uh, decided to consider that. But I wanted to give a couple of examples of how we've been using the care income already. Some of us here are involved in the support not separation, and I know people in the US also are involved in that, which is to stop the state from taking children from their mothers. They take tens of thousands of children every year, mostly, because the women are poor and the state doesn't approve of us and it's a form of social cleansing which hits single mothers in particular and in particular women of color and immigrant women. And it's a, a really horrendous, really a, like a criminalization, you know, of single mothers where you don't really have a boy. You know, you get the, the worst punishment possible. What could it be but to have your children taken away from you? And we are demanding that they take away our poverty and not our children. And there are, there are aspects of the legislation which already say that, that uh, mothers are entitled to money in order to keep the family together, which is not being implemented. And we want that implemented and the work that mothers do to be recognized so that we do get a care income in the form of whether it's section 17, that's what it's called here, or any other money that mothers should be entitled to for the work of raising children. So that's yeah, yeah. one aspect, and I know the English Collective of Prostitutes has been using a care income as well to say, look, if we, if, if we who are mostly mothers do, that we're not starving or threatened with destitution or poverty or whatever, then we wouldn't have to go into prostitution and therefore give us a care income. So there are really a lot of ways in which we can use it. Thank you, yeah. Nikki. Okay, so there's a couple of other questions. Uh, one for Nina, saying evictions have been suspended in Germany too, but deportations continue, including to Iran and Afghanistan. Stan, there's some benefits and victories for some documented workers. I think this is actually mainly news. Thank you for your news. I think that's from Lucilla. Um, uh, there was a question about whether Sam could say anything more about prisons. There was a question about, I don't think anybody answered the question about people receiving care, as in people with disabilities. And then uh, there's a question, how do we ensure that paying women for care work does not, however, 
unintentionally support the idea that care work is women's work oh, well, and um, I just wanted to say that there is one question that I think that's premised on denying that trans women are women because it describes trans women as biologically men and uh, I'm the the connection with a care income se seems to be how can a care income be distributed fairly but uh, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that because I think the premise of that is very discriminatory. And then uh, there was a comment just about the question that you answered, Selma, about uh, when you said about whether the question about whether is for care work that's life sustaining or also work that is production. And I, somebody was asking, does that mean the uh, production work as in growing food? Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Stefania, did you have your hand up for any of this? Well, um, I think that um, many uh, many of the of these questions have been touched upon by people before me. Uh, so I I will just um, uh, want to add them, uh, one point that um, uh, there are many uh, many technical and many, uh, many details, uh, detailed aspects of uh, um, the definition of care income that we have left in the GNDE, we have left deliberately open because we do think that uh, this must be a conversation with many, many more voices than just uh, the, the four of us. So we are, we are, I am actually very much welcoming all these inputs and uh, questions and, and, and feedback from the people participating in this webinar. Um, not because I, I do have answers, you know, definite answers to all these questions. I think uh, um, uh, uh, there is a lot of work still to be done. I think that what we wanted to do is to um, invite uh, economic policies and social movements, actually, to invite social movements to rethink economic policies around care, to rethink wealth around care rather than uh, material production. So once open this, let's say, Pandora box, I would say, then then we could we 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 need we do need to discuss many things starting from this. I I am sure, uh, but I think. The, 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 the first step uh, is, um, uh, is, is important, no? And so, yeah, I'm grateful for this, for this discussion. I think that Giacomo wanted to uh, answer the, um, the question of uh, uh, how we distinguish between care, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if care production, uh, care work is also productive. So uh, I don't know if we can uh, unmute Giacomo so he can uh, answer to that. Okay, thank you, Stefania. Is it possible uh, to unmute Giacomo, Phoebe, our tech crew there? And perhaps while you're looking for Giacomo, I think uh, Sam, part of that question was put to you as well. And uh, I think some of it to Selma, that last round of questions. Do we have Giacomo yet yes. off mute? If Hi. not, yes? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Welcome, yeah. Giacomo. Well. Good morning or good evening, it depends where you are in this moment. Well, I think it's uh, simply um, uh, misleading, uh, relate the idea of, of a income or a productive income to something that is not productive. I think have been, this is, have been debated a lot and the distinction between reproduction and production is not a matter of productivity. Indeed, uh, there are many, um, care and reproductive uh, activity that are productive indeed and of course for example in the definition that stefania gave and shared with us uh, there are many activities related for example to food also or uh, to natural uh, and ecosystem um, work that are productive indeed so i mean this distinction between care and productive or reproductive and, and productive is something that misleads us just because we are all in the imaginary of econo economic productivity and the idea that we only produce when we work for the market. I think this is 
wrong and we we should take the idea of uh, care and uh, reproductive as very important productive action that we do indeed. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, Selma. Uh, and what I, I think that what I want to say really does follow from Giacomo's refusal of these uh, categories of productive and unproductive, which mean do you make profit for somebody else or don't you? Um, uh, on the question of whether subsistence farming, for example, is caring, <clears throat> depends on your situation. We know there has been a movement in a number of countries in Africa and maybe in other parts of the world that we don't know about where women threatened by seven years in prison pulled up the coffee plantation, the, plants, the coffee trees and planted subsistence crops so they could feed their families. That is a struggle to care because it's a struggle to feed and it's a struggle to get your land back and you can call that easily a care income in the form of land because it need not come in the form of cash at all it depends on the social relations on in the society but it, it is um, when you are a carer and a child or adult or person who is diff have uh, difficulties are in your hands you do what you need to do to make sure that person survives and enjoys life to the full and whatever you do is part of your caring and in the same way as we don't want the firm distinction between productive and unproductive is it productive of happiness if is it productive of survival is it is it productive of life is our um is our the way we judge things in that same way what you need for survival and what you get what you work for to make the people cared for and and um able and happy those are the things that mean that you're caring that it's caring work so working you know, in a, on a plantation, uh, a food plantation is not caring, it's exploitation. But working to feed your family, that is caring. Thank you, Selma. And Pranam, did you want to uh, weigh in here? I see you have uh, popped up a couple of times there. So please indicate if you would like uh, to be <laughs> unmuted. And I think Sam may have wanted to say something else. Just very quickly, the, a question came up a couple of times about the care income institutionalizing gender roles. A quick comment on that. For those of us who are uh, descendants of people who were enslaved, when we were fighting against slavery, fighting to get money instead of being enslaved, the case wasn't made that uh, people of African descent, people enslaved, getting a wage would institutionalize us in that work. In fact, it would give us more power to refuse uh, that work. And indeed, the more wages we were able to win, the more power we had to refuse that work. But unfortunately, I think that happens um, on this whole issue. And it also says a care income for the caregiver overwhelmingly now that's women but i think we heard from sam and others that we know that men will increasingly do that work it says a care income it doesn't say only for women right so um nikki i i don't know if the the questions nikki you raised before were answered i i see sarah calloway um, had some issues about money stolen from Africa yes. in the global south. Sarah doesn't have a mic actually. I think that's the problem. Uh, so and she, but I think Pranam definitely did want to speak. I don't know if she can. Uh, yes. Um, and, and also, Dean uh, has something on the farming. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the struggle to care, which Selma talking about, because many women human rights defender in Thailand fighting for against the forced eviction and they in jail right now. 
So it, they also that struggle to care for their family, to get the food and also the income to caring for their family. So they end up in jail now to fight against the, the forced eviction. And I, I like to refer back to what Selma said about the caring for life, for the, it means human life, but also the nature. I think the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is sending some message to the people about the humanity is placing too much pressure on the natural world, which is bringing the wildlife more close into contact to the people. That's why we're having the virus. But also even the World Health Organization also emphasizes about the need to protect biodiversity because of its importance to the human health, such as the provision of the food, water, and the source of medicines. But that's a public health perspective. And we know that women are the one who carry to plant for the food, to harvesting them to feed the food and product the food and the water and the source of medicine. So I think this is very well linked and interconnected in the issue of care for life, the human, but also the nature. Thank you. Thank you for that, Renom. And uh, yes, yeah, question. Dean, we, we wanted to hear something from Dean. And then uh, I, just as a time count, uh, we do have about five minutes left. Uh, some people may want to stay on and, and continue the discussion, but I just wanted to indicate uh, that uh, time for this webinar. Dean. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm, I'm also with Pedro. I'm a subsistence farmer um, not far from here. Um, and just uh, like uh, farmers, even like the the farmer, the farming we most we've been trapped into this industrial farming with all those chemicals and um, even it is uncaring. That that kind of farming is totally uncaring of people. It's making us all sick. It's an uncaring of the land, and but we're trapped into it even if we want to be caring. And like this care income would give away that I mean there's a lot of farmers want out and want to want to regenerate the the land and our health and everything and that's quite possible there's a there's a whole um there's a whole there's a huge movement of of, of developing that kind of agriculture the Via Campesina has been at it for a long time there's like 300 million people in that in that movement and just uh uh yeah well uh I've lost the rest of my thought, but I got some of it up there. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, can we do, uh, Nikki, just a, a time check here. We've got four minutes. Should we try to fit in another question before we do have to wrap up? Because we do want to know um, for people who are on the uh, participants here, but people who would like to work on the Care Income Now campaign to help build it, to put their name and email in the chat box and anything in particular that you would like to be doing. And also if people haven't signed the Care Income, um, call for the Care Income, please, please do so. And you can get the link for that at www.globalwomenstrike.net. Perhaps we'll type up uh, that, um, that um, address there so all could see it. But meanwhile, Nikki, do you think uh, we can just have like one other quick question and then the group can decide about adding on an additional 10 minutes or so? Nikki? It may be that Nina wants to, this is a question for Nina and it was a question I missed when I was um, uh, reporting on one of the comments. It, the comment was about on the one hand, um, uh, evictions had been suspended, but deportations continue and borders are closing because of this uh, virus crisis borders are closing and people are still being crammed into prisons and camps how do we make sure the victories are long term and that the crisis that will deepen even as the spread of the virus curve flattens doesn't lead to a backlash for women and migrants i don't know if nina can deal with that now or whether it's something that uh, we should try and deal with uh, you know directly afterwards and then there were various comments about how a care income also supports women's demands for pay equity and uh, Sarah's comments which you made reference to she also spoke about the trillions that have been stolen from Africa and the global south destroying life and the environment but those comments are on the chat so hopefully people can see them 
If I could just add something, apparently um, people have been raising their hands, but um, only the host has been able to see them. I have not been able to. I can't have, see them either. Yeah. I can't I see them hands. either. <laughs> right. So we apologize for people who have been raising their hands. Um, I guess at this point, just put it in the chat. I'm sorry. We Also, uh, Nina just said that she crashed. Her computer crashed, so she can't answer the question. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, <laughs> that answers it for it. I, again, really apologies for people who are raising their hands. I mean, we're getting used to this technology and communicating in this way. Uh, it's just been wonderful to see so many uh, participants from around the world. And please uh, continue, perhaps, um, Eric, if you would be so kind to put up an email address for people who perhaps had a question and wanted to chat and they weren't able to, to do it now, uh, they could email and get their you know, their questions and, and their comments in, because we really do, it's very, very important that we hear from, from everyone and know your situation on the ground. And as I said earlier, we really, really, really want to hear from people who want to work on the Care Income Now campaign where you are and to share the, the resources, including money, that people in your country, in your uh, rural or urban area, um, that you were able to win. And we also urge you to sign on to the call for the Care Income at the, um, the, the top of this hour. We did announce we had about 222 people thus far signed from 24 countries. And even that was before we really did a wide kind of uh, announcement and uh, launching of it. 167 people signing on uh, to today's call from so many countries around the world. Um, I don't know if uh, Phoebe, before we, we all give a shout out to each other, if it would be useful to get a sense of how many countries did we hear from? Uh, Phoebe, do you have, uh, do you know some of them off the top of your head? I, I saw a list I'm, somewhere. I'm sorry, I've been concentrating <laughs> on the discussion and I-, I Can I just say there was a comment from Ireland, uh, from Maggie, but again, it's in the chat, so hopefully people can see it and it can definitely be in any report. But I know that it included Australia, Ireland, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Peru, uh, the UK, various places in, in the US. We had 28 countries before. Yeah. Egypt, yeah. Egypt, I saw, Greece, uh, Russia. I mean, it, the, it's, it's just been an outpouring. And I think it really speaks uh, to the need that we have right now, particularly in this time of the pandemic, but not only in this time of the pandemic, because I think we're really beginning to uncover, Stefania talked about a Pandora's box. It is now being opened and we can see all of the possibilities that a movement such as this can strengthen all of us wherever we are. So one of the things uh, we did, we're gonna ask that all participants, uh, anything else? Uh, yes, yes, so um, Margaret. Selma? Before we move on to that, just to say, people are putting in the chats their emails and saying they want to be involved. The other thing too is if you are able to translate the sign-on letter, the open letter to governments, um, and say what language you are. I think we have about ten languages done or being done, but please um, put in what language you can do and your email. Right. Thank you so much. Salma, did, was that was your hand raised? Did you, Anina, did you want to say something quickly yes, before we yes, wrap up? Yes, yes, we just wanted to add, uh, I just wanted to underline what Stefania has said, because right. it's very much our point of view, which is how we've come together on this issue, which is that the care income is short on technical details. And that is exactly how we want it, because it's <laughs> not, it hasn't been put forward by technocrats which is very unusual for any, right. kind, for any kind of proposals called the Green New Deal of any kind. And coming, okay. from, the, and, and coming from academia. And it's coming, it's uh, what they're trying to do when they put it forward, which we very much got involved precisely to do, is because it's a movement building uh, proposal. And together we can work out what the different countries want, what the different communities want, what they think they could win at a particular moment, how to make the case, 
had to incorporate it into whatever campaigns and movements are already going on. I think that's really important that we don't get caught in trying to figure out every little detail of what does this mean and what does that mean. We're just moving away from that. It's really a new way of looking at things, which is really the way that, that uh, women who do the caring work, in a way, have always looked at it. Except that now we're saying the whole economy should be looking at it in that way. You know, all the policies should be looking at it in that way. And the climate crisis, in a way, has given us this opportunity precisely because what is, what is the point of being a billionaire if you're, everything is getting flooded and you can't grow food anywhere? I mean, let's face it. You know, the crisis is really at that breaking point, so we have to address it. And a care income gives us a way to address it wherever you are, as well as many other demands, of course, that people have. So, Stefania, we very much appreciate we do. the way that you look at it, and Giacomo making the point that we're moving away from productive, non-productive definitions, as in GDP and all that, which have always left us out and left out what's really important, which is our survival and our well-being. Right. So Thank if you. people yeah. want to stay in touch, please, we, you know, we want to build a movement with that. So leave your emails and all that. But I just wanted to make clear that that's what we want to do with it. Thank you so much, uh, Nina. And we really want to thank everyone for participating today. We really look forward to working with you in the near future and building the Care Income uh, Now campaign. Every time I've raised it from rural uh, um, um, in the United States with farmers and environmentalists, et cetera, people love the Care Income. They see how it can be useful to them. So what we would like to do, uh, Phoebe, we wonder if we could take all of the participants off mute so that we could give a shout out to each other. Is that possible? It's so good for all of us to be together. Or is it off? So on the count of three, then we say on the count of three, everyone please say their income now, okay? So I'm gonna count one, two, three. Income now. Now. Come now. Thank you so very much. And we look to be all of you and being together again. Thank you. Thank you. The Eric and Thank crew. You. The technical crew here. <laughs> the translators as well. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.